Good morning, everybody. And a warm welcome to Blackburn Baptist Church here in Galligrees. We're beginning our service of worship this morning by reading together from Psalm 32. Psalm 32. The words will appear on the screen. We read the whole psalm together. Please remain seated to read. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you gave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in your heart. And that is what we're going to do now. This morning we have a very special guest, participant. Well, it's a home team player really. Good morning Esther. And when you said, when I said would you like to do anything in the service in the next month when you're here, you said that will probably be fine. And now you get the privilege of leading us in singing today in all the songs from the beginning to the end. And you're going to begin with a song over a thousand times to sing. And please stand up if you're able to and join us in singing this wonderful hymn. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. 
the variety and the wonder of life that surrounds us. We praise you <clears throat> for all the opportunities, the challenges, the experiences and the achievements life offers us. We praise you for all the things we can think and do and see and touch, hear and feel smell and taste, we praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb of the world, suffering servant, heavenly King, for the love that surrounds us each day through family and friends, the fellowship of the church and the inner presence of your Holy Spirit, we praise you. Yes, dear Lord, we have so much to praise you for and thank you, but we are not oblivious to the fact that so much of our lives is not as you intended it to be. We think of the horrific murder of children and two adults in the Texan school. We pray for the comfort that only you can give to their loved ones. And we pray, too, for wisdom for those dealing with gun control. A quote comes to mind which says, The only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We continue to lift Ukraine before you, Lord, and pray especially for the young women who have been raped by the Russian soldiers. Hear them, Lord, in mind and body, and give them the courage to see justice done. So many countries where evil flourishes, have mercy on us, Lord. Give courage and protection <coughs> to all your servants who willingly like Brian and Jackie Childers in Chad, obey your call to love and serve those in troubled times in many different ways. We pray now for our government with so much to consider regarding the desperate needs of those, especially on low incomes, as the cost of living rises every day. Maybe for the first time in, the, in their desire to do what they think is right, they might turn to you and say, what would Jesus do? We thank you, Father, for your sacrifice of your son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit who dwells in every willing heart. We pray 
that those in our families and our friends may come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We thank you especially for the Kingdom Come movement from this time, Ascension, to the day of Pentecost, as we pray daily for five people. We pray that our prayers will be answered and that they will come to faith in you. We remember too our own dear families and thank you for them and all who need a special touch from you. Also, Lord, we remember the young people at this time as they have set and sometimes are still to set their exams. We ask you to keep them calm and that they may remember all that they need to to be successful in passing their exams. Now to our precious church family. How lovely it was, although especially sad for their families, to ce celebrate the lives of Janet's brother Tom and Beryl's husband Brian. God of all comfort, comfort those who mourn. We are happy that John Bunstead, after a fall and a short stay in hospital, is now back home. We pray too for Brenda Seed, back with us today, as she recovers from a short time in hospital. We remember others who are recovering from surgery and those waiting patiently for appointments not forgetting those who experience troubles daily. Just be with them, Lord. May they know your closeness. As we look to the future, after all the hindrance of COVID-19, we pray for wisdom and strength for our leadership, as they and we as a fellowship look to the future and seek to know what we should do to bring your kingdom to the streets of Galagreaves and Blackburn. We have much to look forward to this week as we celebrate our dearly loved Queen's Platinum Jubilee. We pray that we will feel your presence with us and all that we do with our Christian brothers and sisters from other fellowships will be successful and honouring to you. Finally, as we learn to trust you more, dear Father, and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, I am reminded of the story of Jehoshaphat, who prayed, Lord, the God of our ancestors, and you, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands and no one can withstand you. Then later on, your spirit came upon Jehaziel, who said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of, because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. <clears throat> May we who live today trust and pray that the battles we face, although we are sometimes called to do our part, are not ours, but yours, dear Lord. Amen. Amen.
offering him this morning is in Christ alone my hope is found in Christ alone my hope is found if you wish and are able to do so please feel free to stand to sing thank you you for all the good gifts that you give us, that we are your children through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. What a wonderful, marvelous, unbelievable, everlasting gift you have given us. So what we're giving you now, we're giving thanks to you for who you are, for what you've done, and what you are continuing to do in our lives until we are with you soon in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> I said something different always happens, and that's what it was this morning. Well done. Thank you for your help, Paul, too. Our Bible reading this morning is going to be taken by Brenda Seed. Um, just adjust the height a little bit. Thank you, Brenda. 
a Bible reading this morning. I'm reading from the Good News translation, as Alec asked me to. It's uh, in St. John chapter 17, verses 6 to 19. It's actually a prayer. So we've already had a reading and a prayer this morning. Now this is a reading and a prayer combined into one. It's a prayer Jesus prayed for his disciples. I have made you known to those who you gave me out of the world. They belonged to you, and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word, and now they know that everything you gave me comes from you. I gave them the message that you gave me, and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and my glory is shown through them. And now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. While I was with them, I kept them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me. I protected them, and not one of them was lost, except the man who was bound to be lost, so that the scripture might come true. And now I am coming to you, and I say these things in the world, so that they might have my joy in their hearts in all its fullness. I gave them your message, and the world hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I send them into the world, just as you sent me into the world. And for their sake, I dedicate myself to you, in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. Amen. <coughs> reading one prayer, one reading and prayer together, what could come next? Well, Lord be my vision supreme in my heart is the song I've chosen to sing now to ask Esther to lead us in singing and then we'll have a short message or not so short message uh, but let's sing from our heart. Please feel free to stand if you're able Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Debbie, at the back and Paul at the front. Warm greetings from my wife, Sabina, on this day as well, who is doing night shift and not able to listen directly on my mobile. I'm sure we are looking forward to the Platinum Jubilee celebrations on the coming weekend. Is there anybody who's not looking forward to the celebration? I don't expect you, so I'm not looking forward to it. God willing, on Friday here at BBC from 4 p.m. on Friday, we will be hosting St. Luke's, St. Aidan's, and the Russian-speaking New Life International Church. We've had some challenges putting together the risk assessment for that, but Rebecca has got it sorted out now. Well, almost. <laughs> In the context of our series on spiritual warfare, I have been wondering what kind of risk assessment our adversary Satan might have made for our worship service and gathering this morning. I don't mean with the entrances and the exits, chairs and such paraphernalia. I'm not even making, for me, a relative indirect hint at the challenges that we've been having with the sound system, though I do take the opportunity once again to thank all those personally and directly involved in identifying and helping with solving the problems. I think most of us identified that there was a problem. Thank you for solving them. But what does Satan's risk assessment for the content of this worship service look like? Now you're waiting, aren't you? You haven't heard one of these before. One, the living God, the Lord Almighty, will speak to everybody present. High risk. The likelihood that some people will close their hearts and minds to what God says. Medium to high risk. The chance that many people will hear direct from God for the first time. Risk level unknown. The expectation that the hearers will come in and go out as different people. Very high risk. The gathering could result not only in lives being transformed inside the church, but also outside of the church. High risk. And the gathering could lead to changes in thought and behaviour patterns, medium to high risk. May our God, the living God, open all our hearts and minds to hear what he wants to say to each one of us today. Amen. About the time the building began on the new homes opposite, and it seems like a very, very long time ago now, I arrived early on a Sunday morning, thanks to a lift from my neighbour, a pity on me, and saw the new signs the contractors had put up outside our main entrance, saying, keep out, danger to life. So I did what you would normally do in this situation, so it's a major emergency, so I wrote a letter to the deacons that we needed to place signs in front of our entrances saying something like, please come in, welcome, build your life on the rock, Jesus gives new life. And I remember getting an email one day from Paul with photographs of what he made and put up, and uh, I was really pleased, it was really good. Jesus gives new life. And when some time ago I sent the diaconate an email with a list of proposed titles for this series on spiritual warfare, the final message, which is this one, was to be titled New Life Church Discipleship, which led Paul again to think maybe I was talking about the Russian-speaking church, if you remember, which meets here on Fridays and Saturdays, but I wasn't. The title was a reference to our need as a church to lead a new life of discipleship together as servants of Christ, as disciples of Christ, as members of his body here on earth in Blackburn and Darren, which is what I hope, think and pray we are all aiming at from our hearts to do. But we all know from our experience that this is very often not a comfortable journey. And at our Thursday evening fellowship meetings last year, we looked in alternate weeks in our Bible studies at Ephesians Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and we saw that there, in Ephesians we have three chapters of doctrine, teaching, and three chapters of walking with the Lord. And in the last three weeks on Sundays, we've been looking at the second half of chapter 6, and we're almost at the end of the letter and of the series on spiritual warfare. 
So you would probably anticipate, you would probably expect arriving at the end of this letter and at the end of this sermon series with all this teaching in our heads and hopefully in our hearts and all this life experience of walking together with the Lord at our disposal, you would expect that we are in a really good place this morning. To be able to rest with this on some kind of comfortable cushion of assurance that we know, know everything and can do everything. To have reached the point of heavenly beauty, harmony and peace. To have arrived in a kind of spiritual nirvana where there's neither suffering, desire nor sense of self. How many people preach a gospel which says or which emphasizes in one way or another that things will always be better with Jesus at the helm, interpreting this to mean that problems will melt or disappear at the press of a button. They may preach a prosperity gospel that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith positive speech and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. But you see, we've been looking in the last two weeks at the end of the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church from prison in Rome, and we now realise that we are in a war zone. I think that's really not what we would have expected or even wanted to be in a war zone. Haven't we been able to make some kind of peaceful compromise in our religion? Some kind of peaceful compromise in our thinking so we can get on with the world as it is and maybe even improve it or touch it up a little bit? Couldn't we water down, so to speak, some of our clear biblical teachings so we fit in better with the communities in which we live and work and have our being? Do we always have to talk as if Jesus is the only Son of the true living God, and that other gods are really no gods? Surely it would be much easier if we didn't continue to do that, wouldn't it? That looks really attractive at first glance. You see, we've come really full circle from what Tim described to us five weeks ago about the reality of spiritual warfare. In all humility, we need to recognize that without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, that we would remain without hope and without peace in this world and in the world to come. The depth and the breadth of the sadness that was being felt and expressed prior to and during the two funeral services of Thanksgiving the week before last here at BBC and which from now on will continue being felt by life partners, family members, close friends, and indeed the whole family of the church, is a reality that is only eventually balanced out on the earth, possibly after many years, if at all, by the knowledge that our brothers Tom and Brian are in the presence of our loving Lord and that those of us who live in Jesus will be with them again, one day, very soon. So we come at last to Ephesians 6, 18 to 20. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Luther said once, and some of you know this, I have so many things of importance to do today that I'm going to spend much longer in prayer at the beginning than ever before. I tried that on one occasion when my workload for the day looked like an attempt to climb the Matterhorn in one go and I was finished with everything at 11 o'clock in the morning. Is that kind of approach to prayer and to work helpful? Is it really necessary? Is it practical? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that senseless? Is that showing a mentally unbalanced disposition? 
I can see you lining up, so to speak, and saying, we need to be practical. We need to do something. We need to know more in order to achieve something. We need to be actively moving on with things. All the days and the weeks and the months and the years will be over before we've reached any of our goals. But hold on a minute. Who sets the goals? Who decides on the target? Isn't that God and not us? Not one of us. Not any one of us. But God, the one and only living God. And what does he say to us? Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Do you say, well, I honestly haven't got time to do that. Too much to do. But let us all, each one of us, and us together, be among those who listen to the voice of God in prayer. Not just this morning. Not just every evening. But every day. He knows. He cares. Trust Him to show us the way ahead. We will let God rule the roost. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. You know something about God? He has got better than 2020 vision. His eyesight is better even than 2015 vision, which is sharper than average. He can see everything, everywhere, and in everybody, all of the time. He is the one to whom we should turn for guidance. He is the one to whom we should turn for understanding. He is the one to whom we should turn for discernment and to, for wisdom. He is the one who reveals to us the truth and shows us the way that we should go and when and how. And another thing, look closely at the context of this verse, Psalm 32, verse 8, about the leading of God. Verses 3 and 4, When I kept silent, could I have it back again, please, Debbie? Thank you. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. We're on the first slide. Thank you. 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like this? Then come to the Lord, admit your wrongdoing to him, and he will forgive the guilt of your sin and my sin. And then look at verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Do we know what that means in our experience and in our life? If that is so, then we belong to the faithful. And then in verse 6, Therefore let everyone who is godly Pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. We are safe in the hands of our God. And in verse 7, Therefore, you are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. We are protected from every possible harm and danger. Nothing can endanger us. And then, but only then, do we come to God leading us in verse 8. You see, the context of God leading us is that first we are made aware of our sin, then we admit our wrongs, then He forgives us, then we know that we are safe, that his arms are all around us, that we are protected and in safety. And only then do we read in verse 8, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. As we read also in Psalm 139, 23 to 24, First of all, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you 
and lead me along the path of everlasting life. We see that asking God to help us and lead us is only effectively possible when we have first been shown that we are sinners in need of a saviour. When we have second admitted our wrongs and decided to make a 180 degree turn away from them and third when God has forgiven us and Jesus has entered into our hearts. Which way round is it? In which order comes the recognition that we are sinners in need of a saviour and are asking God to lead us on? It's a very pertinent question. Supposing you are invited by a friend to a restaurant and you decide to order the dessert first, then the cheese and biscuits, followed by the fish course, then the main course, and then finally the hot soup. Depends which restaurant you're going to, what your budget is. But is that the right way to do things? Is that the right order? Well, like yesterday, there am I eating my lunch, and I said, this is brilliant. what would you have thought if I'd eaten the dessert first and then the main course? And very wise as he said, well, I might have thought that that is more to your taste or that is simply what you yourself had decided to do. But in our life of faith, it doesn't work like that. It is not a question of what we would like to do, what I would like to do. It's not a question of how we ourselves would like to get on with things, how I would like to get on with things. It's not a question of how we want to order our lives. Because we need to realise that before God is going to tell us what we should be doing, we need to come to Him. Admit we are made a mess of things and give Him all the power of decision in our lives back to Him. Is that too direct? God is not blind. He knows where we are at. He is saying, first sort out the wrongs, and then I will tell you where to go. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Paul the Apostle wrote, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We will be looking in a new short series beginning in two weeks' time at prayer, so I don't want to overstep the mark at takeoff, so to speak. But we are to pray in the Spirit. That is the first phrase in this verse. Pray in the Spirit. What that means, we can look at God willing at the date in the immediate future. But I want us to notice these expressions of thoroughness and all-inclusiveness. All occasions, all kinds of prayers and requests. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In the war zone where we are now, we need to be alert. We need to have these things in mind. As I said, we'll be looking at prayer after Pentecost when we will be celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit and we'll perhaps be able to grasp this more clearly then. But finally, I do mean finally, I want us to look very briefly at the last verse of the Ephesian letter. Ephesians 6 verse 24, which reads very simply and straightforwardly. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Is that what I do? Is that what you do? Have you ever been to Ephesus? Yes, I saw that hand. That's great. Yeah. I won't tell anybody who you are. If you have, did you find a church? A definite no has come back. <laughs> Ephesus is located near the western shores of modern-day Turkey, as you know, where the Aegean Sea meets the former estuary of the river Kestros, about 80 kilometers or 50 miles south of Izmir in Turkey. It's an archaeological site now, but that's beside the point. The point is, although there is no longer a city of Ephesus, the church in Ephesus used to be the strongest church in Asia Minor. Now there are hardly even any Christians to be found in all of Asia Minor, let alone a church of any strength or size. Does the Church of Ephesus exist today? No, it does not. It doesn't exist. It had some of the best teaching and the best blessings and the best leaders that a church could ever have or hope for anywhere on God's earth at any time in the history of man. 
Paul not only founded and taught the church for three years, but then they had Timothy as their teaching elder, and even the apostle John. But even though they had the best teaching from the best teachers, it appears that they never heeded the warning advice of Paul to hold on to what they were taught and stay away from false teachers. They lost their first love. We know this because it's the final time the church in Ephesus is mentioned in the Bible in Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7. You'll be familiar with it. The Apostle John writes a warning to the church in Ephesus. He begins by praising them for the things they were doing well. In verses 1 to 3 of Revelation chapter 2. But then he tells them in Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 that they had left their first love. What was their first love? Who was their first love? Well, according to the closing remarks of Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 24, their love was for Jesus Christ. Died and resurrected. But now apparently they'd left behind their love for Jesus Christ. They were now listening to false teachers. They were being seduced by the lies and deceptions of the devil. I had the privilege in March of attending the NWBA, Northwest Baptist Association Ministers Conference at Frodsham in Cheshire. I remain truly grateful for that opportunity. Frodsham is a nice village near the hotel with sandstone cloud paths and often clear views of the Mersey, the Manchester Ship Canal, Liverpool Cathedral and the petrochemical monoliths of Runcorn. <coughs> Couldn't leave that out. I was very encouraged by all the meetings and the discussions and met many ministers for the first time because we never had a chance to get to know each other because of the pandemic. And they didn't really know Blackburn Baptist Church at all. But they knew Leamington Road. They spoke about Leamington Road as being the largest church in the Northwest. God led Leamington Road to Gallifitz. As Blackburn Baptist Church, this is our new home. Many, many people are praying that when people hear the name Gallifreys, they will say, that's the place where the residents love Jesus. That is the place where the living God is worshipped. That is what prayer is all about. Let us all, starting with me, let us all love our Lord Jesus with an undying love and be a living witness to the people around us every day. That is new life, church, discipleship. Amen. Our final hymn today is Who is on the Lord's Side? Please uh, come forward again, Esther. I'm sure that's going to be stable this time. If not, we'll get you another one. <laughs> Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helper? Other lives to bring here. Amen.
to listen to you or not, I do not mind. Let's have a round of applause for Esther and Tim and for the, top, the sound team. Because today, everything, apart from one music stand, has functioned really <laughs> wonderfully, even then, who was able to help. So, now we're going to close the service before the notices with the benediction. Let's remain standing to share this together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we have one or two notices as usual. Today, refreshments after the service in the community room. Please join us if you have time, and if you haven't got time, please join us anyway. Take a break, coffee morning this week at 10 o'clock, followed by at 10.30, please note the change time for this week, a ladies Bible study led by Brenda, and then an informal music evening led by Graham uh, at 7 o'clock, Tuesday evening. A very warm welcome to you, with or without guitar, if you just want to bring another instrument and, and play it or learn how to play it or just want to hear music. Uh, the orbit drop-in should be, take place on Thursday at, eight, at 6 o'clock if we don't need the room to set up for Friday. The fellowship meeting will take place at 7.30 here in this room on the same day and that is the prayer meeting. The Platinum Jubilee celebration and tea will take place here between 4 and 6 o'clock. And this will be shared, uh, we are hosts to St. Luke's and Aidan's and to the Russian Speaking Fellowship with Yuri and Irina who are all glad to share in this with us. It will be a good chance to meet people, for example, John who was unable to come today because of his commitment to youth work today in, uh, in Wilfrid's with St. Luke's. Uh, John, will also, John Reynolds will also be there and his wife. So a good chance for us to get to know some of the many workers from St. Luke's the people from St. Aidan's and Irina and Yuri and some of the people who live nearer to Blackburn or in Blackburn from the Russian Speaking Fellowship. Thank you, Debbie. The movie morning is taking place on Saturday. Uh, it's a really very interesting occasion. I, I don't ever get to watch a film from beginning to end, but that's always been the case in my life. The New Life International Church service is at 5 o'clock on Saturday. The Friday meeting is cancelled. The Sunday communion service will be uh, for Jubilee and Pentecost not led by me but by Paul on Sunday. Uh, on the 7th of June at 7.30 here there is a meeting for any who are willing to join working groups for Messy Church and for building matters. Okay, that's the 7th. And then the 12th of June after this service there's no church lunch on that day. I wonder, are we supposed to be fasting? Is that the meaning? <laughs> I don't think that was the intention of the leadership, but, but uh, we're not having any lunch on that day, apparently. Um, some important is in the fact, so a special church meeting, please attend on that day as well, if you're a church member. And on the 19th of June, there's a visit of Jackie and Brian, two of our missionaries in Chad, which will be followed by the church bring and share lunch. So you fast for seven days and then you get a really good lunch here, if you bring it yourself. Is that right? Well, I'll we'll talk about it tomorrow night. And then, yeah, I thought you might like these. Uh, as a, those, of you, those of you who didn't come to the Bible study on Thursday missed this. Um, uh, it was the, the first or the second public engagement I have as governor of, of St. Luke's Primary School, which was really great fun. We also saw the mayor um, who came and uh, he, had a, he was actually wearing a chain. I know this has been recorded, sorry, mayor. But he was wearing a chain from Darren, not from Blackburn, which is really kind of embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he took a great leap forward and if you want to know what I really mean by that you can ask me afterwards. It was really good, um, uh, this is getting rather long but it doesn't matter I think. The Sidari uh, Academy Trust has bought two kilometres of bunting and um, we kind of get it on Friday because uh, Jason sort of got his hands on it. So we won't get all two kilometres of it because they haven't got enough space to, to, to use. But we'll have the bunting that's on that picture now. Yeah, well, that was it. It was really great. We were there for ages and uh, it was really good to, to be with Cat Brooks and go around all the classes again together. So I think we come to the last announcement which we've already hinted at in our prayers. Thank you, Shirley. We're in the middle of this period now, thy kingdom come. Everyone is encouraged to pray for at least five people. If you haven't started yet, you can still start today if you choose to do so. 
So thank you so much for coming. I think that is the end of our notices. And thank you so much once again to Debbie for calling and you know at the back of the team for preparing that for the screen. So hope to see you in the community room now. God bless you. Thank you.